Thank you so much, Ariana. We're absolutely thrilled to be here, and we're kind of passionate about being women also. <laughs> so this is the hardest session to do because it's right after lunch, and everybody really wants to take a siesta. So we're going to ensure that you stay awake for the next hour because we're going to talk about some really interesting things. So my role is moderator, facilitator, and keeping people on track and asking a bunch of questions. And to that end, I'm delighted today to moderate today's conversation between Candy Brush and Patty Green, who are visionary leaders of research, developing programs, teaching, mentoring, and creating an extraordinary opportunities for women entrepreneurs. I'm going to do quick reviews of their background because if I really did a dramatic reading of everything they've done, the hour would be gone and you still wouldn't have heard them. Candy holds the Franklin Olin Chair in Entrepreneurship and is the Division Chair of Entrepreneurship. She also directs the Blank Center for Entrepreneurship and is the author of over 100 articles in journals, four books, and, the founder, and a founder of the Diana Project. And she was named a 21st Century Entrepreneurship Scholar and one of the top 50 business school professors by Poets and Quants. Patty Green holds the Paul Babson Chair in Entrepreneurial Studies and was previously provost and also dean of the undergraduate school at Babson. Currently, she's the academic for director for Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses and Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women. She, with Candy, is a co-founder of the Diana Project. She has also published multiple books and articles. As you can tell, we have some very, very interesting topics to cover. But first, how many of you are entrepreneurs? Two people, really? Okay, okay. You're slow, see? It's that sleep stuff. You know, you have to be quicker. How many of you have mothers or daughters or sisters or friends or neighbors or customers or suppliers who are women and for the purposes of, uh, who are women, good, and for the purposes of today's conversation, also entrepreneurs? So basically everyone sitting in this room knows or has a relationship with in some way a woman entrepreneur, correct? So this is a really important topic. And it's clear that we have a lot to help you learn. So the session is about how women use entrepreneurship to create financial and social value for families and in their communities. And that's really important for Babson because it's extraordinarily strategic to have gender-based panels for student events to recruit women students in our undergraduate program. We have almost 50% undergraduate students who are women. And in the MBA program, about 30% of our students are women, which are really groundbreaking numbers for business schools. Our Center for Women's Entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial leadership is one of only two in the United States associated with a business school. Babson's work in women's entrepreneurship is in several areas. The 10,000 Women's Project and the Diana Project and the GEM Research, as well as including women entrepreneurs in the 10,000 Small Businesses Program. We also are recognized worldwide as informing practice, policy, and entrepreneurship education. So what we've planned today is a conversation. This is not a panel presentation. And conversations not only involve the people on stage, but also all of you. So what we'd like to ask is that you ask your questions in the moment as both Candy and Patty are talking about their ideas and their views. So feel free to raise questions throughout. And now, Patty and Candy. First question, why should we care about women's entrepreneurship as distinct from men's entrepreneurship? I've actually changed my answer since we practiced the last 17th okay. time. <laughs> uh, just thinking about what we were all talking about this morning and models, and, and one of the things I really enjoy is breaking models and look at how we can do things better. So if the underlying premise of entrepreneurship for us at Babson is about the creation of economic and social value, all the models that we've done so far, with all due respect to everybody in the room, are built on studies and practices by white males over the years. That's the way it was done historically, therefore that's the way it's done now. So looking at women and understanding gender, both men and women, 
helps us look at what are different ways that we can do even better in how we work together inside businesses and how businesses work together to create that value. And so another way to think about this is, as most of you probably know, Babson is the home of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is a 73-country study of attitudes of people who are in the process of starting businesses. And what we've learned from the GEM research is that economies need both men and women to contribute to economic development and societal progress. And so we know, for example, that women are now starting businesses at faster rates around the world. Five years ago, there were probably three or four countries where the rate of women's entrepreneurship or starting businesses was equivalent to that of men. And this year, there are nine countries where there is much more parity in terms of the rates of women's entrepreneurship and men's entrepreneurship. So with increased parity, doesn't that mean women will outstrip men in, in entrepreneurship? And should we worry about that? Or should at least the men in the audience worry about that? Well, I always say, I have three sons. I want the world to be wonderful for everybody. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, we always talk about equality of opportunity. You know, people get to make their choices about what they actually want to do, how they want to live their lives, when they might choose to be entrepreneurial, when they might follow other pathways. But the equality of opportunity is the important part for me. And actually, when you have all members of a population contributing to the development, the innovation, and the ideas, then economies have a better chance of succeeding. Whereas if you have only small populations or one population, then there's less opportunity for innovation and opportunity. Okay, thank you. And we'll get back to that a little later. So Candy and Patty have really been the dynamic duo of women's entrepreneurship, and they've been working together for a very, very long time. And most of your accomplishments have come when you've worked together. How did you meet? <laughs> How did this happen? Why are you partners? And, mm -hmm. and what are the implications for us? Candy and I first met when we were what we like to call later stage doctoral students as opposed to more old, old, more, old. More mature. Yeah. <laughs> Either one of those. Um, we both had had business careers and we both had been home with kids for a while and that type of thing. And when we'd gone back at separate schools, didn't know each other, the, our senior professors got to know each other, two, two gentlemen, and were talking, and they realized that they each had a later stage doctoral student who was married to a pilot, who each had three kids, although boys and girls, and who were interested in women's entrepreneurship. So when you think about mentors and the importance of mentors in your life, these were our two mentors were talking to each other and decided they really needed to connect us. So that's how we met. And then the other thing that was really um, kind of interesting is that I had done the first and the largest study of women entrepreneurs in the United States. And Patty had done one of the first studies on minority entrepreneurship. And so I think both of us were interested in populations of entrepreneurs that had not been widely studied. And so that was an immediate connection. And then there was one other connection, and that is that we were both really interested in how firms acquire resources and use those resources in firms. And in most cases, the research that was done to that point studied only established firms. And so Patty and I, with another colleague of ours, Marwa Hart, mm -hmm. we did some of the early research um, on how new ventures acquire, use, organize, and create value out of the resources in their firms. And it's really sort of the foundation of what we now call ETA at Babson, because it's the creative approach to how you acquire and use resources. Starting with what you have. You got it. So how did you both end up at Babson? We, was that a, like, a team event or? <laughs> no. you know, it, it goes back to the personal approach of how life turns out sometimes. Um, I had been, uh, actually Mark Rice, who was the former dean of the grad school at Babson, was also a later stage academic uh, doctoral student. There's a pattern here. It really is. <laughs> whom I had met at the Babson Doctoral Consortium one year. And he knew how old my kids were. And I'm sitting at work in Kansas City one day where I had the Kaufman chair. The phone rings and he goes, Patty, isn't Sean graduating from high school this year? I said, yes. He goes, time to talk. So that's when he asked if I'd be interested in applying for the, the, the dean position at Babson, and it worked out very nicely. Thank you very much. Yeah, see, I was at Boston University for 17 years where I got my PhD in strategy, and I'd been teaching. I was happy. I was working with Patty, of course, remotely, 
and um, Patty was then dean of the undergrad school, and I got a phone call that said, why don't you come over and have lunch? And I said, well, I really like my job at BU. I'm not coming. I really liked my job in Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I went over and I had lunch. I had a lot of lunches. And finally, I decided that it would be much more fun to be with people like Heidi Neck and Patty Green and Andrew Zacharakis and Julian Lang and Joel Schumann, all the professors in entrepreneurship, because I wouldn't be the only entrepreneurship professor. I would be one of a division it or a department. A and so yeah. I moved. And by the way, Patty and I are both parents of graduates of Babson. Babson graduates, yep. yes. So we get the P on our little name badges now. And I do too. I almost do. My son's graduating from the Fast Track program in May, so... You get the P in May. I get the P 15. Another landmark in your career was the founding of the Diana Project. How did that get launched and why? So I'll start and Patty can pick this up. So uh, the Diana Project, um, and as I mentioned earlier, I had done research on women's entrepreneurship. And so in 1996, we were at an academic meeting actually at the beach in San Diego. And um, there was a group of us talking about um, what we might do to look at how women grow their businesses. Now, if you remember 1996, this is sort of the boom of venture capital. And so businesses are getting lots of venture capital. They're creating huge funds. And we wondered if women entrepreneurs were getting venture capital. At the time, about 38% of all US businesses were owned by women. And so we found a statistic that said they weren't getting that much venture capital. So with Patty's help from the Kauffman Foundation, um, we acquired data, 30 years of investments in U.S. businesses, and we hand-coded 21,000 records to determine the number of businesses in the U.S. receiving venture capital that had women on the leadership team. And the answer was 5%. Well, was actually 4.9%. And so that was sort of the beginning of the Diana Project. The thing about the Diana Project, why we wanted to talk to it in preference to talking about the 10,000 Women Program, is we've really laid a solid base of the research. You know, what is the context? Where are women entrepreneurs? How are they growing their business? Where are they not growing their businesses? So we kept on that, that research and expanded it globally, really, so we could look at not only those related to equity capital, because again, that's such a small sliver of any economy, to really women growing businesses and what kind of resources they needed in general. Yeah, one more thing. So um, we're celebrating our eighth international conference at Babson this year, and we have participants, we have more than 500 people, scholars, who are participating in uh, the Diana Project from more than 35 countries. We've published more than seven books and countless articles. And the important sort of two takeaways, one takeaway is that in many cases, the researchers that attend our conference are doing in sometimes the first study on women entrepreneurs in their country, like Bangladesh and Ethiopia and Nigeria and Pakistan. And so it's important to understand the landscape of entrepreneurship in a particular country, and some countries have not done that research to start with. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention one thing and then ask a little bit more about it regarding Diana. Um, you were given the research award for global entrepreneurship in Sweden, which is, from what I understand, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in entrepreneurship. That's what we told our husbands. <laughs> yes. yeah. and so why is it so important? Why, why is this whole body of research so important? It goes back to it's, it's half the population, half the population of the world. I mean, that's half the talent pool out there. So given that we did recognize that everything we knew was based on male studies, the world's really recognized that a lot of the creation of value comes from women's participation as well. I would also add that um, we actually have some short legislative histories in a lot of countries where women were maybe not allowed to vote or they had to have their husband's permission to work. You've got tax laws. Even in the United States, we didn't have the Equal Credit Opportunity Act until 1978, which meant that women could not get loans in their own name. So if you think about the legislative history in lots of com countries, it's kind of a short time frame within which women have been starting and growing businesses. That's changed in most countries today. Today, and that's, I think, why we're seeing this rise that we saw in the GEM research. So I'm going to pause here for a moment. Any questions, thoughts, areas that you're curious about? Who was Diana? <laughs> it was Diana. We get that question a lot. 
So the backstory to that is that we had five researchers, um, all from different disciplines, all from different schools, and we had um, four different funding sources, including a Swedish Research Foundation, the Kauffman Foundation, U.S. Small Business Administration, and we couldn't come up with an acronym that had 14 things in it, and so we were somewhere. Goddess of the hunt. Yes, exactly. She's a hunter. She's not a gatherer. Yeah, hunt and when for you're research, for yeah, resources, yeah, when you're trying to raise money, you're hunting, and so that's why Diana. And they, I have to say, are one of the few um, groups that designed their, a piece of jewelry <laughs> that is completely did not awesome bring. for the Diana Project. <laughs> what can we say? Only women. Yeah. Okay, so the Diana Project informed us about women's access to capital. What is it about training for those women who want to grow? Mm -hmm. Well, this is where I think it's a good time to talk about the Goldman Sachs programs, because I, I've gotten a lot of questions about them just in wandering around the last few days. And the, the short backstory is that in 2008, Goldman Sachs realized that they were doing a lot of small pieces of philanthropy, and they wanted something really large and impactful. So they combined a lot of their giving, and they created 10,000 Women, which was a program outside the United States. It was in e emerging economies, focused on women growing business, not starting, not turnaround. And these are not subsistence businesses. The average business had 15 employees. The average revenue was about $150,000, which, by the way, is really close to the average revenue of women-owned businesses in the United States. And they worked with 43 different, in 43 countries with 85 partners and delivered this program, and they hit 10,000. Last year, they hit their 10,000th woman. Um, what we saw from the outcome of that was that, in general, the average, uh, about 72% increased their revenues by the six-month point, and they increased their revenues an average of 177% at six months. Uh, as far as job creation, 49% of them increased their, their jobs at six months, and they increased them ab almost 50%. So that was the outcomes of it. I'll come back later and talk about the collaboration, but they hit their 10,000th woman. Two years into that, people were saying, well, what about the, inside the United States? And they decided that rather than having a program like 10,000 and Women where every single site created their own program, they wanted a national U.S. program for men and women, again, focused on growth. We've heard the theme about growth today from Dan, that this was about growing businesses. They came to Babson with five bullet points and said, we'd like you to create this program that really connects an, um, entrepreneurship education business support services, which was the advising, and access to capital, which was not through Goldman, but through community banks with, with Goldman funding assistance. Um, they said though that was the beginning. They wanted to do it through community colleges so they could really reach deeply into and have community engagement. They wanted it to be modular and, most importantly, scalable. We designed it within about five months and launched it. I will say we launched it before we were completely finished with it, but you know that's a startup, startup model. To date, in 10,000 small businesses, which is the United States, men and women, 13 sites across the country, including one that is now part online and part face-to-face -face and based at Babson, um, four sites in the UK, will hit 5,000th, our 5,000th business owner this summer. And as far as the outcomes at the six-month point, 64% of them have increased their revenues, about 68% each, and 45% of them have created jobs at about 36% each. So very solid. Over half of them have grown their revenues by more than 50% six months after finishing this program. So really happy with that. The way it comes back around to 10,000 women and our focus on women is based on that work. As we go into phase two for 10,000 women, we've been asked to do the same kind of job, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, uh, let me just ask a quick question about the statistics for 10,000 uh, small businesses. Do you see a difference between the women businesses in the program and the men-led businesses in the program? It's a really good point, a question. So I'm going to swear everybody in here to secret because we're going to release our second progress report in about six weeks. It's at the designer. So I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody. Okay? Promise. At six months, there's almost no differences as far as the, um, the actual outcomes, both in the increase, those who increase revenues and those who create jobs. 
at 18 months, which is the first time we'll be sharing 18 month, then again we start seeing differences where men are growing their business, more men are growing revenues and creating jobs. So there are some different patterns in there, but to me, this is the most amazing database ever because the United States doesn't have great data to begin with on, on, on small businesses. But this is a specifically a growth-oriented set of entrepreneurs that we can actually now study how they grow, when they grow, who grows, who doesn't grow, what are the challenges, all those kinds of things. So I'm assuming one of those questions that you're asking will be what accounts for the difference? We are, we are. We're certainly looking at industries. There are some industries, but like most of the businesses in the world, most of these businesses are professional services because that's what people do. There's no other industry that is more than 10%, so there's some industry differences. We're looking at timing, you know, family often comes into it, what else they have to be doing in their life. But we'll be, now that we have this data, we'll be diving further into it to better understand that. Great, so everybody sworn to secrecy? Yes, yes. Nod your head, okay. Candy, There's a question. Question, question back Brandon? here. Hello, hey. I was actually just saying that um, I was going to keep it a secret. I was just giving you a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. We can't, oh. we can't hear it very well. Okay. I was just saying that I was going to keep it a secret, but I'll go ahead and ask a question anyway. Uh, <laughs> now that I have the microphone. Um, I, I'm actually curious as to what is the long-term vision for all this data that you guys are acquiring? Like, what is it that you guys hope to accomplish? The long, what is the long-term vision for the, for the Goldman programs? Exactly. It's a, you know, it's a really good question, too, when you think back to the last session, because this is a very different program in that Manzanales, very grassroots, very locally funded, incredible model there. Different model for Goldman Sachs. They put half a billion into 10,000 small businesses. What we're working on now was the deal was that we would be in each market for five years. We're going to be extending in some of those years. But because the, the gift to the community is, has three parts. It's the educational program. It's we train the community college on how to teach entrepreneurship. And it is working on the ecosystem. We're working on sustainability. So we work with the community college presidents about how can you roll the educational piece into the college, how can you connect with the other resources for the business advising part and for the other resources needed, the mentoring, those types of things. So long-term sustainability, knowing that at some point grants will stop, has been part of the model from the beginning. And, and Candy, I think I cut you off before. Well, I was just going to tell a short story because um, I've done some work for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women's Program, and actually both Elaine and I have taught on the 10,000 Small Business Program as well. We helped to write the curriculum. But one of the things that struck me when I did a curriculum assessment for the 10,000 Women's Program is the stories that we got. And one of the stories we got was from um, a family in Peru where a woman in the textile industry had gone through the program. And as a part of the program, she had uh, they introduced people to distributors and people to help them export. And she was able to turn her business around within a year and a half and um, throughout the process, she said she did not have the support of her family. Her, her husband and her parents were not supportive. But she was able to grow her business so fast and so well, she now employs her husband and the rest of her family. And so we see that this um, sort of effort to help these women grow businesses is changing uh, the ways that family, family roles kind of work as well. So kind of a nice story. Exactly. OK, moving right along. So what have you learned from this body of work? What, what would you say are the key lessons that everybody in this room should understand? OK, well, I'm going to start um, here by just talking a little bit about the latest Diana Project research. So the research we did in 1999, we recently replicated last year. And so what that means is that we analyzed all the investments in U.S. businesses over a three-year period to determine the number of investments in companies that had a woman on the team or had women CEOs. And we also looked at the venture capital industry to see how many women partners there were in the industry on the theory that if a venture capital firm had women partners, they might be more likely to invest in companies with women. I'm going to give you a couple of quick statistics. We found that, yes, 
the number of businesses receiving venture capital that had a woman on the team rose from 5% to 15%, good news. The number of companies that had women CEOs receiving venture capital was 3.3%. It was actually 2.9%. 2.9 what? 2.91. So it was small. And then finally, um, in the venture capital industry, we found that the number of partners in venture capital firms went from 10% to 8%, it declined. So women were leaving the venture capital industry and still a small number of companies with women CEOs were receiving venture capital. So we wrote this report and um, I think one of the things that was really uh, striking, I have the report here, I can send it to anybody who's interested, was that we received a billion, not a million, a billion media imprints. Now, in the history of Babson, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor is probably the number one sort of thing that drives press attention to the college. But this report pre exceeded that by so many more hits. And the thing that was really exciting is that it drove so many more uh, media inquiries about all kinds of entrepreneurship to Babson from all the major media sources. With TV, radio, I could, we could name all the newspapers and so forth. And I think one other thing that was really interesting is that um, many times it was not me or Patty that was quoted, it said a study by Babson College. So the publicity generated from that one story to the college was enormous. And I think it goes back to um, kind of what Oriana was saying about how coming to Babson is a place that celebrates and appreciates women's entrepreneurship. For me, the ongoing learning is really the connection between the service, research, and teaching aspects of Babson. So for, for, if I focus now on the Goldman programs again, we've had such strong support from our president, starting from Barefoot Schlesinger and now our president Healy, because it so fits with the mission of who we are. We, we design these courses. We deliver these courses to actual business owners. We evaluate the daylights out of them, and then we bring them back into the Babson classroom and say, what have we learned that is more about small businesses? Um, we have new ways of teaching finance, new ways of teaching accounting, new ways of thinking about reflection and the role of reflection, new ways of talking about the importance of collaboration, because we have data now that shows that business owners who collaborate with other businesses are more likely to grow. So from that, we learn how to break and question models. I, one of the things I love about Babson is we're never afraid to ask the hardest questions and then try to figure out how to get the answers. So it just brings the teaching, the research, the service. It also lends us, as Candy was saying, not only the press, but we are guiding a lot, and not just we. You know, we've got lots of partners standing beside, behind us at Babson, you know, really guiding policy discussions. You know, the World Bank calls, the White House calls, IFC calls, all these people call because we understand women business owners. You know, we have the numbers, we have the experience, we have the program building. And I see President Healy has her hand up. <laughs> this might be a tough question, Patty, <laughs> and I'm worried. <laughs> Diana Research created, oh, there we are. Um, the reason is because those statistics are so frightening. Mm -hmm. They're so disappointing. Mm -hmm. How is it that we can only have 3% of women-owned businesses being funded by venture capital firms? How is it that can, we can have a declining number of women making those decisions about who to invest in? Why is this happening? And so my question to you is, you know, what did you see coming out of this with all these, all this attention coming to this data? Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what are you think, seeing other people planning to do about this? And also then what are we doing through our own Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership? Yeah, so uh, thank you for sort of setting up a great opportunity for us to provide a little sales pitch here. So one of the really important things, and I think to some degree we got more attention for the numbers about the venture capital industry than we did for the numbers of businesses um, being funded that happen to have women CEOs. And so one of the things that was really amazing is that 
when Patty mentioned all the phone calls, we got a call from one venture capital firm that called us and said, we want to change the ecosystem and we want to do it with you. And they said, we would like to hire two women MBAs as interns, and they did that within two weeks. One of the interns has just been offered a full-time job as, uh, to work with this venture capital firm. So that's a really important ecosystem change, and they really believe in trying to change the way that the investment community looks at women entrepreneurs, and also on the other side, to train more women to be partners in venture capital firms. So next year, um, Breakaway Innovation Group is the name of the VC firm has put up a $500,000 prize. We're going to have a competition for women entrepreneurs that will be consumer-facing products, which is a little bit different from most venture capital competitions. We're going to have it at Babson. It will be highly publicized, and it's an opportunity for women entrepreneurs from everywhere to apply for this $500,000 prize. There will be coaching involved to coach those women entrepreneurs um, to do a better job of presenting their business ideas and their business models, as well as training for women who desire to be on the venture capital side. So to your point, Carrie, this is what we really think is the beginning of a change in the ecosystem that I think really needs to be done. It's back to what Patty said about breaking models. Yes, and, and I admit that for once I'm probably less optimistic than Candy about this. Um, I do think it's, it's a step. I think there's some backlash op possibilities as well. I mean, some, some equity firms are actually talking about they need to keep it more male-dominated because of the, the recent lawsuits are, are one matter that, that's been a big concern in Silicon Valley. So there, there's really a question about how we get it out in front of people and just provide the data, have a conversation, and even for our students. So generally, the women undergraduates, when they graduate, they say, pretty much pat us on the head and say, there are no more gender differences. You've solved it for us. Thank you very much. When they come back to grad school, because now they're competing for the really big resources, the jobs with the higher salaries and more opportunities to grow, now they're saying, oh, I see what you mean. There still are differences. How do we do that? And, and I just want to add an aside. Um, sh shortly after the research came out, I was uh, teaching in Milwaukee in the Scalarator program. And I got a call from the mayor's office asking if I could do a hurried presentation on the Diana research. So Candy and Patty graciously gave me the report, which I turned into slides very quickly. Um, but the, mayor's, uh, the mayor wasn't able to attend, but the room was completely full, and the mayor's office was there, number of venture capitalists in the room, and the mayor's office said, we are speaking for the mayor, we challenge you to do something better than these numbers. If Milwaukee's going to grow, we've got to change this one too. Mm -hmm. So it was an immediate impact in terms of how then do we change it. And it's so insidious in some ways too. So for instance, one of the things we learned from the, ten, the, the data in 10,000 small businesses that we didn't suspect, we, we asked everybody, do you pay yourself a salary? You know, that's like, are you a grown up business? You pay yourself a salary, there's the thought. And then we asked, how much do you pay yourselves? When we got the results, I had them rerun it three different times to be sure because there was a, a significant gender difference and the gender difference was exactly the same as it was in the general workforce. So women, when they were making their own decision about what their salary is, were valuing themselves about 20% less than the gentlemen were paying themselves. Exactly, because they come in from industry, they think that's where everything's pegged, that's the knowledge base. So asking questions, getting data out there, putting it into practice, that's what will drive change. And I'd just like to jump in here too. That's one thing that we've done really well at Babson is we curate and we convene. So we curate a lot of research and we convene different research projects. So I see there's some questions, so I'll questions. stop. Um, we need a microphone. I am really interested in this last piece of conversation just because I have a daughter coming out of grad school at an you know, MBA, two-year MBA, and there's this whole issue about the packages that women are being offered, the, the girls, I mean, all the, versus the men, and, if you, and that women do not learn how to negotiate as well these packages just because, you know, oh, I'm grateful I found this, this is great, while the reaction of some of the, her fellow male students they're much pushier and they get better results. I mean, how do we teach girls or, you know, the women 
to negotiate better packages. So Babson is one of maybe a handful of schools that actually has a class called Women's Entrepreneurship and Leadership. And I've been teaching this class for 10 years, and some of my students are here. Ariane is one of them, and um, Maria Becerra is here as well. And so there's some, it, that is exactly what we work on in the class, is we do role playing of negotiations. We talk about these facts, which is the statistics. We learn about the history of legislation and how that plays a role. And the students actually discuss and try to understand where there are disparities and where there are opportunities, because it's both. It's not just that everything is bad. There are opportunities, and they have a lot of talents that they can, they can move forward on. So we're one of the few schools that offer, I mean, that's kind of like a sales pitch for my class, but it's well, but, fine, but it's also But it's also the mission of the Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership. Um, we run an open enrollment program in conjunction with Susan Duffy, who's the executive director, um, focusing on um, essentially looking for women's leadership, looking for opportunities. And core to that is she does an exercise called the Reflected Best Self, which asks the women participants to think about what their critical strengths are and how they are viewed by other people, which is a real eye-opener that leads to discussions about how do you present yourself in negotiations? How do you present yourself as ready to move to the next step? How do you take an active role in driving your career as opposed to being a passive hoper that good work will be recognized rather than being seen as self-promotion? So there's some significant ways that we know work in helping women achieve the goal that you raised. The challenge is, are there, enough, uh, are there enough opportunities for women to participate in the programming that enables them to learn the right lessons and practice them? And that's, before we go to that question, too, um, one of the things in 10,000 Women, and I challenge each of you to think about your own country, it's one thing to have the skills, it's another thing to have the confidence to use those skills. So my challenge also about many of you that work with entrepreneurial education programs, when they're for women, largely the only thing that has to do with women is the fact that all the students are women. And on the flip side, for 10,000 women, what we've done is for every single task and skill that someone needs to be able to do to grow a business, we've looked at the underlying theory about what are potential gender differences and built that into the curriculum. And then we actually measure confidence levels. So we look at, do, are you more confident now? Do you have the skill and you are confident to use it? And that's having a huge impact. There was a, there's a yeah. couple questions. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. Good. Good. Over here in the middle. It's a microphone. It's on. OK. A quick question. I listened to a great podcast two weeks ago from Diane Green, who was the founder of VMware and she's now on the board of Google, and she was talking with Mark Andreessen all about board members sitting on a board, creating a board for your company, a mentorship. And one thing that Diane Green said is that she won't serve on boards for startups. And I found that very interesting as a lead and a role model and a female entrepreneur saying that she doesn't want to be on a board of a startup. So I want to kind of tie it to the Diane Project. How do you find role models and mentors, people like a Diane Green or a Sheryl Sandberg or a Donna Dubinsky, and create them as role models for these great women entrepreneurs that are growing up today? So I think we, we're a little trouble here. The question really is how do we find the role models for the startup, women role models for startups? Well, there, frankly, there, there are a lot out there. You know, and they're, they're often invisible. Um, they're not putting their hands up often in volunteering. So there's a question of, A, we grow our own, is, is one thing. There's, I mean, there's role models sitting in this room right here. Um, we tend to always go to the same ones and think that they all have to be like this. So recognizing that there's a huge diversity and actually expending the energy to find them and ask them and groom them. And also the, the range, too. So. We don't necessarily want a Donna Dubinsky talking to our $1 million company. We want a $10 million person talking to our $1 million company. And once in a while, a Donna or something can float over the top. But we want to get them going that they, can, they don't always see themselves in the role models. 
We want role models in which they can see themselves. And actually, in most cities, there, as Patty mentioned, there's these networks. I know in Boston, there's a CEOs group, and they get, to di get together for dinner once a month. Now, it's not a membership organization. It's an informal network. I know they have groups like that in Silicon Valley. They have it in almost every major city. And I would venture to say you've got them here in South America as well. So it could be a group of 10 women who happen to be about the same stage of development of their companies. And they're probably in different industries. And so there's a lot of what we call peer learning. In fact, mentoring does not have to be senior to junior. It can be junior to senior. It can be peer to peer. And so I think that, you know, thinking about mentoring in a different way is really important as well. The, the other thing I wanted to add. Question. What? They've got three more questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thank you very much. It's super informative. Um, what would you say some of the say top three reasons why women entrepreneurs aren't as successful as their counterparts? So right off the bat, I would come out of my chair and ask you, how are you defining success? Yes. Um, so, just say in terms of being able to flourish 18 months out. So th they do last as long. So it's the flourish, lasting sustainability isn't the question. The question is how much they grow with revenues and jobs. And there we're talking about what do they actually want to do and what fits with the rest of their lives and what are other measures of success. So generally, financial means is not the top motivation for creating a business. It's usually in the top three or four, but it's not usually the top. So here, really thinking about what's your definition of success is a very important factor. But we'll still, Candy will answer your question well, about right. financial piece. So it's actually not, it's top, financial is not necessarily top for either men or women. Um, but when you look at the goals of the organization, men are more likely to have purely financial goals for their companies. This comes out of the GEM data again. Um, and women tend to have more hybrid goals. And so back to the 10,000 women's report, we see that women are giving back to the communities. In fact, one of the things we found was that they're much more likely to mentor other women, this answers the first question, um, if they have been through this training program. Mm -hmm. So that's another measure of success that maybe you weren't thinking about. And we have to go to another question. You're right. <laughs> You're the boss. Okay. One, there was one other question. Ah. Hi. My name is Adrienne Harrington. I'm in the Evening MBA 2014. Move the uh, mic up. Yeah. Oh. Hi. My name is Adrienne Harrington. I did the Evening MBA program. Um, I had the fortune of seeing Hillary Clinton speak last year at the Women's Conference, which was a wonderful presentation. I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear what she said. Um, but she spoke about her message when meeting with other heads of state on the role of women in economy. And the message started out as uh, more of an equality perspective. When she changed her tone to the economic potential, I think everyone's ears kind of perked up and they started really talking about how they can make a difference. Is there anything in this data set or in your report that maybe can lean the message in that sense? What opportunities could there be from an economic potential standpoint? So I'll give you one answer um, out of the Diana report, because what we found is those venture capital firms, well, first of all, venture capital firms that have women partners are more likely to invest in businesses that have women on the team. That they are also more active and they do more deals per year. And so that suggests that if you have women on your venture capital team, you're going to have more opportunities. And so more opportunities leads to more economic development for all populations. Okay, okay so question. we're now going into the speed round because I've gotten the magic sign. So last question, what do you want to be your legacy? <laughs> well, I, I feel like I'm working on my legacy right now because we've just, we're now working on phase two of 10,000 women. So Babson has received that grant. And the difference is, while I mentioned in phase one, every site had their own curriculum, what they'd like us to do is the work, same as we did the work for the 10,000 small businesses, is now there's going to be a global entrepreneurship curriculum. And just last week, we had the first six countries come to Babson to start training on that and jointly creating what should be the most amazing global, global curriculum for women in entrepreneurship that's existed to date. And it'll be a continuous learning theme so that we're always learning from the participating countries what's universal, what has to be customized, what are local kinds of issues, but continuing to build that model. So I want to answer this uh, as it relates to my role at Babson because I think one of the important things that's happened after all of this work that we've done for many years is that 
you know, we're getting um, opportunities from new partners, Walmart, Coca-Cola. Um, we're talking about a partnership to train women entrepreneurs in Africa. And so this is really benefiting Babson because it's allowing us to take our ways of teaching, what we've learned from these other programs, 10,000 women, 10,000 small businesses, how we teach entrepreneurship, what we do in the ecosystem projects, what we do in these other things, and to transfer this knowledge to new populations. And so I think one thing that we've been really good at doing is collecting the data or collecting the facts through these different projects that allows us to make decisions that allow us to move forward with programs or policies or new opportunities. So we don't have any more time, but Candy and Patty will be, we have five minutes. So more questions? Okay, over here. Maria. Maria. Um, just based on what you were saying, I know the IDB has a program, uh, the International Development Bank, at least regionally, in encouraging uh, women entrepreneurs as well as women on, on uh, board positions. Do, do you work, because your project sounds like it would definitely um, enhance their search for young women entrepreneurs for projects. Um, do you work with the IDB at all? Have, have they ever approached you? Have you ever? I don't know what the Which group was it? The International Maria? Development Bank. They I don't think we do right now. We're really looking at the second set of partners, mm -hmm. and really IFC is the big partner because between Goldman and IFC, they've created what they're calling a facility. I, I don't know why the facility part, but a facility for funding women entrepreneurs with a, a literal goal of funding 100,000 women entrepreneurs in emerging economies. So always looking for partners and talking about partners because e from an ecosystem approach, lots of different kinds of resources and training and educated needing. How do we all feed each other mm -hmm. and make sure the business owners get what they need? Let's talk. Okay. Me again. Uh, one of the reasons that I was excited to come to this talk is that I have two younger we'll, we'll sisters. Move the uh, microphone up. <laughs> one of the reasons that I was excited to come to this talk is that I have two younger sisters, and I was hoping to take something away that I could, you know, share with them and give them some motivation so that they can be able to accomplish the things that they want to accomplish in their lives. Now, setting aside the fact that you guys are women, you guys have accomplished a lot in your lives. There's a lot that you guys have done, and my question is more personal. What motivated you as entrepreneurs and as educators to do what you do today and to set such big goals for yourselves? What gave you the confidence to do what you do today, to be the people that set the standard for the future? What, what gave us the confidence was the last part? What, what motivated us? Yeah, what motivated you to do what you do to today? Do it. Yeah. Um, I think motivation is looking at the world of business and questioning, is this really the best we can do? So going back to what I started off and saying, is this the best way we can work together to create value? Definitely, I'm very interested in the creation of economic value, but also social value as well. So looking for, for better models. For the, for the confidence piece, mentors. I've had ama and continue to have amazing mentors. I invest in coaching. You know, athletes of coaches, I pay a coach. You know, just looking for how do I always continue learning and not always that confident, you just keep working on it. Thank you. So uh, I would say that my motivation has come, I consider myself an academic entrepreneur. So I like to look at puzzles in the research or gaps in the research. And so that was really the motivation when I first did the study in 19, <laughs> about women entrepreneurs in the United States, um, there was no other study. I did the first and the largest study in the US and that was a huge, it was like, why haven't we looked at this population? We can't consider all entrepreneurs to be the same. And so I think that's been a driver sort of throughout. And so as I get deeper into, you know, sort of different nuances of not just women's entrepreneurship, I study a lot of other things too. Entrepreneurship generally, I'm always curious about those questions that we cannot answer, that theory does not answer. So I guess I'm just kind of a curious person. Okay. It was a question back here. Hi. I think I... Okay. 
I think a, a lot of the problems that women have experienced in business through the ages is the perceived role that they have within the family. So I think it's the fear of losing that role that women have inside a family that has held them back a little bit in the business world. What has been your experience with these 10,000 women as to how the role of how they interact inside their families has changed once they are successful entrepreneurs? So if I understand your question, you're asking about how roles have changed for women entrepreneurs in their families. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, how, how the role of the women inside their families has changed once they become successful entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And that's a question that varies a great deal by country. So again, through Jim, through Diana, through a lot of these things, we really have to look at you know, how does culture play a role, how do societal impacts play a role, all those kinds of things. So in general, we look at how many women are even in the labor force in different countries. We look at do they have access to the markets, can they physically go to the market is, is even a question in some countries, those kinds of things. So it's hard to generalize across everything how the roles have, other than saying, as Candy started out by saying, um, we see a lot more of them, and they're growing larger businesses. They're more present in all kinds of conversations. We're just interested in keeping that conversation going. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.